Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the session. Um, it takes a village, the Linux Foundation projects focus on blockchain and digital identity. I'm very excited to share some of the work that our community has been doing. My name is Daniela Barbosa. I am the general manager at the Linux Foundation for blockchain and identity projects. I also have the honor to serve as the executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation. I've been with the Linux Foundation for uh, five years. It's going on five years um, working with Hyperledger uh, from the start. Um, my background is in library and information science. Um, I have a master's in information science and have really been fascinated all my life with data, with access to data, internet data, um, the trust uh, uh, paradigm of data. Um, and obviously, if you think about libraries and the features that they provide society, uh, really being able to access information uh, uh, with, within a trust uh, framework. Today, you know, increasingly more and more, the focus in our digital world is about objects, identity, and money, and taking those objects from place to place to place, whether it's physical, or in the metaverse or in other environments, uh, more and more it is about the objects and what objects we own based on what our identity is and obviously the, um, the value or the money of those objects. Um, our economy depends conf on confidently providing things about ourselves, so informations that we provide about ourselves. For example, you show someone your business registration documents or your credentials in order to open a business bank account. The majority of the world is still doing legal paperwork in, uh, in, in paper. Uh, in, in this example, if, you're, if you have a business, you just started a business, and you want to open a business bank account, you have to prove that you are a business, that you've incorporated into a business. Then you go to the bank and you do it and you show them that certificate. Then perhaps you have to go to the health office to get a health certificate because you're opening up a restaurant and you have to take that same certificate that's been verified by the uh, government, by the issuing government, and you say, you know, now I need to go get this health certificate. Then I take that same certificate over and I go over to maybe the liquor license department and I said, now I need to have a, a liquor license and I have the certificate on it. So the certificate is, 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 um, uh, confidently saying this is who you are and you have a business and you have to go and get other verifications based on that. Um, today, like I said, most of this is done in paper. Um, we see uh, you know, increasingly people digitizing these processes. For example, in the government of British Columbia, uh, three years ago they launched a project called Orgbook where they've already uh, brought in millions of business entities into the org book. And that is a place for that whole flow that I just talked about. You incorporate in a business, you have to go to the bank, you have to go to the healthcare, uh, you have to go to liquor uh, license. All those things are now done online through the government of British Columbia using a hyperledger uh, projects that I'll talk about in a little bit. So uh, from a digital perspective, maybe you have some NFTs, you have some cool NFTs, maybe you're one of the lucky ones with one of those bored apes or something, um, and this could be a digital art object, um, and you want to take that digital object from place to place to place. And you might even be given special uh, experiences for that NFT. I might show up at a concert, and because I have an NFT that I purchased or I won in some way, maybe I have a different experience as, as in the person, in a person, in person concert uh, as well. Or maybe I am allowed to become part of a Telegram group that is participating um, as part of that NFT, that non-functional token that gives me the rights, but it also tells me about what it is about myself. You can think about also digital key credentials um, to start and drive your car. Um, do anybody here in the audience have a car that has an electronic key on a mobile pass? Um, there are many cars now that do offer that, um, and you know, you will eventually need to verify who you are, that you are a driver of that car, and be able to drive that car so you can go from place to place to place. So whether it's in the physical and the digital world, uh, these technologies are really important. Then as a consumer, 
You also want to know, for example, the titanium that's used in that electrical vehicle that you have that mobile wallet for. You want to be, uh, you want to be sure that it's mined without slave labor um, and is sustainable. So titanium is one of the minerals that is used for EV cars, uh, batteries. Um, and there is a lot of slave labor and a lot of issues with it from a sustainability perspective. There are companies, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, that are helping facilitate that for the consumer to know where it came, and then the car manufacturer to also know, uh, specific to car regulation, for example, in Europe with the European car battery uh, regulation, companies now need to disclose that they've gone uh, their, their minerals from a sustainable um, source. So for all these interactions of people going from place to place or digital, your digital identity going from place to place, for trust you know, applications and, ser and services, um, I really believe and we really believe obviously that open source development is essential to do that. At the Linux Foundation, uh, you're here at Linux Foundation Open Source Summit. Uh, many of these projects are representative here, and we do touch a lot of pieces of the individual consumer's life. Uh, Jim today talked about the Academy Award uh, software, um, uh, Academy, uh, software project. Um, there's Linux Foundation Artificial Intelligence. There's Automotive Grade Linux. So here we have the uh, open source, uh, most critical projects in the world. And it's no different for blockchain and digital identity. The projects that sit under the Linux Foundation, and I'll tell you about these in a bit, are really focused on building that open source trust, open source code and communities for companies, individuals, and government agencies to build their solutions on top, specific to blockchain and digital identity. We are also a very diverse ecosystem of enterprise technology use cases. And I'll talk about them today, but we really, when you think about blockchain and digital identity and the principles behind digital identity, things like verifiable credentials and self-sovereign ID, um, it really goes across different uh, uh, industries. So it applies in the education for uh, universities, for digital identity, for energy, for insurance, supply chain, capital markets, and even more and more so when you think about the metaverse and the new experiences that are being developed, it really you know, is a, a place where these types of technologies need to be developed in the open for open communities. So for digital trust, I like to call it as a digital trust umbrella at the, uh, at the Linux Foundation, there's a couple of projects that I like to highlight. One is the Hyperledger Foundation, and six tw since 2016, Hyperledger has been focused on bringing open source blockchain and blockchain related projects into the Linux Foundation as part of the Hyperledger Foundation umbrella. Um, we currently have uh, these uh, identity specific uh, projects, open source projects, Indie, Aries, Ursa, which is the cryptographic, and I'll talk a little bit about these, and Hyperledger Noncreds, which is our newest project. But we also have over 11 special interest groups and working groups that people come together to talk about these requirements. Uh, DIFF is um, one of the JDF, the Joint Development Fund projects at the Linux Foundation. It stands for the Decentralized Identity Foundation. And since 2017, they've been writing technical specifications uh, and reference implementations and coordinating with the industry around decentralized identity technologies and implementations. Um, they're doing some really great work. They have 10 uh, active working groups now, and they're publishing a lot of the work um, and technical spe specs that they're doing. Another organization at the Linux Foundation that is working on the governance uh, aspect of digital identity started in 2020, which is called the Trust Over IP Foundation. Um, they have a Trust Over IP model um, that if you have not read through it, um, highly recommend taking a look at it. And they just also published uh, last month the Trust Over IP technology architecture V1 spec. Um, so they're really making a lot of movements forward to creating the governance um, of digital identity. Um, and last but not least, in 2023, Jim mentioned it earlier in the, in, in the um, keynote, uh, we will be launching the Open Wallet Foundation. So I'll talk a bit about that as well today. So let's focus first on the Hyperledger Foundation. So since 2016, we've been creating uh, blockchain and blockchain-related open source projects and communities. To be very clear, 
or blockchain software, we're not a blockchain. There's not a public blockchain that sits under the Linux Foundation. We are an open source project. There's code projects that sit, um, and currently we have 16 different projects that I'll talk a bit about. Um, we, uh, there are you know, blockchains, obviously, that are run through separate entities. Even at the Linux Foundation, there is a project called OpenIDL, which is an insurance regulatory data network that is a blockchain network. Um, just like all Linux Foundation projects, we are a global team of developers. Um, companies, governments, uh, and individuals are participating. And we always strive to be as transparent as possible. There is no pay to play. And this is why I think specifically with blockchain and digital identity, open source is just so critical to what we do. So let's talk a little bit about decentralization and how we define decentralization. Um, it's a degree to which a single entity or a group of entities control something. So this can be measured in a variety of ways. Uh, the largest portion of control by the single entity, one person or one organization controls everything, or the number of entities it takes to completely control a system. How do you over, you know, over 51% and then you can control the system as well. And there's other complicated metrics um, that the maths folks are more, um, um, uh, that can talk to you about. But we talk about absolute dictatorship when it's totally centralized. Once again, that use case, only just one person uh, or one entity. Uh, moderately decentralized and totally decentralized uh, networks that we see. So what is a distributed ledger? Um, and what is the difference between a blockchain and a distributed ledger? The way that we see it is a blockchain is an append-only system of record or transaction log. And a distributed ledger is a distributed database with decentralized trust. Now, most popular blockchains today are distributed ledgers, and most popular distributed ledgers are blockchains. Um, why, you know, why, you know, why are some, what are some of the popular blockchain systems? Um, obviously, Bitcoin um, is a distributed base for money, so peer-to-peer -peer money transactions, which is fully decentralized. Um, and uh, Ethereum is a distributed database for programs for fully decentralized, uh, decentralized trust. And then projects, for example, like Hyperledger Fabric that sits under the Hyperledger Foundation are distributed database for programs with partially decentralized trust. So in a database or blockchain can be thought of as a, a store of records, basically. Um, but who gets to decide what records belong in that database? Who is making that decision? If one person or one entity decides what's being written into that blockchain, then it is a centralized system. But if many entities have the deciding points, then it becomes a decentralized entity. Um, and there is no yes or no. There's a continuum of how you address decentralization uh, from a fully de uh, decentralized and fully centralized view. Um, so up on the top, you see a fully decentralized view, as I mentioned before, things like Bitcoin and Cardano and Ethereum and Avalanche. Uh, they're public cryptocurrencies uh, with proof of work or proof of stake consensus. Uh, we have distributed ledgers with BFT, uh, Byzantine Fault Tolerance consensus, uh, things like Hyperledger Fabric, Eroha, and Sawtooth, um, and distributed ledgers with crash fault tolerant consensus like Fabric and Corda. Um, and then there's traditional databases. And there's many, many reasons why you should use a blockchain. And there's many, many reasons why you should not use a blockchain as well. Uh, databases, for example, are very efficient. They have a very, uh, from a performance perspective, they're much more efficient than, um, than, um, than a blockchain. But you make a decision based on do you want a, a decentralized, how decentralized, or how fully centralized um, system you want. So some, a brief history of Hyperledger, because I think it's important to understand these projects and the evolution of these open source projects within the Hyperledger Foundation. So we started in 2015, the project was launched, and in 2016, um, we added four new projects you know, uh, as the first year. Uh, the first one was Hyperledger Fabric, and this was a contribution by IBM um, and Digital Assets. Um, and then we had Sawtooth uh, and Eroha. Both of them are distributed ledger frameworks as well, and Explorer is a blockchain explorer tool. So this was, in 2016, the first uh, projects that we have. Today, um, we have 16 different projects, but Hyperledger Fabric continues to be the most adopted in the enterprise distributed ledger permissioned blockchain space. Um, today, this uh, report just came out with, in October by Blockdata. Um, 
A hundred companies were surveyed as to what distributed ledger technologies they use in their systems, and 38% of them um, are using Hyperledger Fabric. And you can see here some, some very large brands with different use cases around uh, supply chain, around trade finance, and other types of use cases. So Hyperledger Fabric, just a couple of highlights from uh, 2022. Um, it is the only project that we have at the Hyperledger Foundation that has long-term support. They're already um, with the, the latest version of 2.2 um, as well. A couple use cases. Uh, one is with Alliance um, and their insurance company based out of Europe. They do global insurance. Um, and they built a, uh, an insurance claim system using Hyperledger Fabric um, across 20 different European subsidiaries. So each subsidiary basically is running their nodes um, around uh, establishing a single source of record for the claim. So if you are a you're Swiss national and you go to France and you have a car accident, they can very easily uh, consolidate the, um, the, the claim that you put into the agency as well. Um, and they are using smart contracts uh, to determine how the costs are split between the different organizations when they do have to pay back. So increased, um, uh, increased um, access to the funds that the companies need as well. And obviously the consumer is going to have uh, their claim uh, fulfilled earlier. Um, I talked a, a bit in when there was the picture of the mine a bit about you know sustainability and the opportunity for uh, blockchain and blockchain networks to really address things like supply chain providence. Uh, this company is circular. Um, they're based in Europe um, and they've created uh, basically a blockchain network um, that is mining that is taking the mine titanium from the mines all the way into the car. And if you know anything about, you know, and I think some people in the room probably know about uh, car manufacturing, you know, the original thing that is pulled out of the mine looks very, very different than the thing that goes into the car as well. So a circular is using blockchain to track the whole providence of that material, even as it changes shape and as it becomes part of other things as well. This is really important because it is, um, you know, part of the compliance requirements uh, that you have. And I did upload these slides into the sketch and most of the slides have links to different videos and webinars that you can take a look, a look at. Another one, you know, with one of our Japanese members, uh, Fujitsu, um, they just came out with this use case uh, working with the botanical water uh, technologies company. Um, and their goal is to deliver, you know, world, uh, water to the world. Um, and they're doing, uh, recovering water uh, wasted water that is being used to make juice or ketchups or sugars in the food production um, and they're reconverting that, reusing that bottle um, and selling it uh, out. So they used uh, blockchain, they used Hyperledger Fabric uh, to create uh, a secure trading uh, platform of the sustainable water. So it is always, uh, it's visible as to you know where the sales and the refinements and the delivery of the water is going. Um, but it really helps people understand and trust where the sources are coming from as well. Um, and there's some great videos on their website as well. Um, in 2017, then we moved along. Uh, we had Cello and Indy and Burrow. Quilt was one of our first uh, forays into interoperability. Um, Hyperledger Indy is a framework uh, for uh, digital identities uh, that are rooted in blockchains and it can be used uh, with other blockchains or as a standalone uh, framework as well. And there's many use cases already in production using Hyperledger Indy to do digital identity. Uh, things like ID Union in Europe um, as well as uh, projects out of Canada like the Energy and Mines Digital Trust um, implemented. And what they're doing is they're using um, the uh, verifiable credentials in a lot of these processes um, as we talked about before. Uh, the government of British Columbia, we actually have, there's code in GitHub that was created and, co you know, created by the government of British Columbia to create a digital wallet um, and you can go and download the wallet and it's in testing phase right now and it uses Hyperledger Indy and Aries as well um, and it allows you to present the digital credentials that we were t I was talking about before um, that you have licenses or memberships or different permits but it is I can only show those credentials to the people that I uh, um, I, I say is okay, right? So you're not creating something that everybody can see all the credentials that you have, but it's confidential connections. If I need to, um, I'm applying for a job, for example, and I need to tell 
my job here, you know, I need to tell the, you know, my education credentialing, for example, I, am, I allow the, that, essential, uh, that education credential to be uh, displayed um, to the, uh, the employer that I might have. So as we build out, um, you know, we started working on identity projects in 2017. In 2018, we actually took URSA out of Indy. It's a cryptographic library um, because it can be applied and used across other different DLTs. Um, and we started um, seeing growth areas um, specifically around payments and trade finance. Um, so a couple use cases very quickly. Once again, there's links on our website and in the deck that you can follow through. Uh, the Global Shipping Business Network, we just published a case study on this, um, is uh, based out of Hong Kong and China. And they are uh, basically doing shipping between 300 different organizations. Um, and they're, um, they're tracking the bill of lading throughout the, um, the entire system as well. Trade Lens, and I'll put this up here because it is, uh, just got announced that it's shutting down. Uh, for five years that we were working on the TradeLens platform with Maersk. Um, it was a Maersk IBM project, um, and they have shut it down. And I truly believe that there need to be some, uh, some, um, some big losses or some big things that uh, don't go well for us to continue to do these projects even better as well. Um, and uh, outside of trade finance, the central bank digital currencies, a uh, project Cambodia uh, Bacon was the first retail CBDC using Hyperledger Aroha. Um, and we see uh, Hyperledger, uh, Fabric, and Bezu being adopted across the world. Uh, according to the Atlantic Council, 105 countries today, uh, so it's over 95% of the global GDP are exploring CBDCs. And as you can see here, many of them are choosing to do their um, e either pilots or experiments or even in production uh, with Hyperledger uh, projects as well. Uh, we did publish a, cent a central bank digital currency ebook recently, um, and there you can learn about a couple of things. One is why do the central banks care that the code needs to be open sourced, right? Um, and we do a lot of advising and working with the central banks, with BIS, with MAS, to talk about them about the principles of open source and why they should really take those considerations. So you can download this ebook. It's in both uh, Japanese and English. It's on our website, or you can go to the deck. So as we continue to mature, um, in 2019, we saw projects like GRID, which is a supply uh, chain domain-specific project, ARIES, which was another component that came out of Indy um, that uh, is addressing in the digital identity, um, and Bezu. In 2019, we had Hyperledger Bezu, which was a contribution by consensus um, into uh, Hyperledger. So the key is that not one blockchain fits the fits, you know, fits all. Um, and what I mean by that is that you can have, um, in, in maybe in 2016, a lot of people would, content, would argue with the fact that you needed a public blockchain. Or there's the Bitcoin maximalists, they'll say, you cannot have a permission blockchain. It doesn't, blockchain does not, cannot be permissioned. But the reality is enterprise uses and just global uses as a whole really needs the ability to choose, pick and choose which pieces are really relevant to what they can do as well. So just very quickly, a history of Ethereum in Hyperledger since 2019, as I mentioned, we've had the Hyperledger Bezu uh, project in the uh, Hyperledger Foundation. Um, and we also um, recently got awarded the Ethereum Foundation Client Incentive Program because for those of you who are familiar with Ethereum, um, there is, uh, since the merge, they are transitioning to a modular blockchain design. So they have consensus clients, um, and then they have execution clients. And Hyperledger Besu, although you can run it as a permission blockchain, and I'll talk about how those are, um, is also an Ethereum mainnet execution client. And it's currently in the top four of the execution clients. And this is very important for the Ethereum ecosystem and the Ethereum Foundation. This is why they chose Bezu as part of that client incentive problem, uh, program. Because you know, a bad uh, bug in Geth, which is the, the, the most used um, execution client, can certainly bring the whole main depth down. So Bezu is really helping with um, that diversity. Uh, a use case using Hyperledger Besu is Lackchain. Um, it's uh, sponsored by the Inter-American Development Bank uh, in Latin America and in the Caribbeans. And what they've built, once again, because what they needed is they couldn't just have a public blockchain. They couldn't just use a public blockchain. They wanted a public permission network that they had 
the ability to have governance on top of it. Um, and now they're building use cases. I think there's over 50 use cases already around digital identity, financial services, digital agro processing businesses, um, academic credentials, which I mentioned before. Um, and this, once again, is a partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank and LAC chain uh, to build out LAC, uh, LACnate, and that is using Hyperledger Besu. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in, in NFTs, uh, so NFT, uh, NFTs are obviously something that are very popular worldwide. And we do have uh, a project um, called Palm. Uh, and Palm uses Hyperledger Besu uh, to create the Palm network. Um, and some of the bigger uh, NFT um, uh, projects like the DC Comics one um, and Damien Hurst, which is a really cool project that they did it was called The Currency, and what he did is, um, he's an artist, he's a UK-based artist, he's very big. Um, he printed out 10,000 where he, he painted a large canvas, it was a huge canvas, and then they uh, cut it out to 10,000 pieces, and he sold those art pieces, um, and a typical Damien Hurst will go for you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, so it's a small piece, um, and he put those on auction, and you could buy a piece of art. And when you bought the piece of art, you bought two things. You bought the physical art piece, and you bought the NFT version of the art piece that came with NFT rights and distribution rights. You, however, didn't get either of those. You had one year to decide what do you want to keep? What do you want to burn? And for those who you know, um, understand NFTs, and the, the, um, you, burn, you, burn, you can burn a, a, a token. Um, so people had to decide after a year if they wanted to keep the physical picture or the digital element. So those kind of experiments are really fascinating just to see how society is interacting with NFTs. Um, and you can, you, can, you, know, you can Google it, it's called the currency, and you can see uh, they burnt a lot of pieces of art. Um, and I you know, considered, you know, what would I do? Um, I think I would keep a physical piece of art because you know, how many times can you have a Damien Hurst? Um, in 2019, we also launched our Hyperledger Labs where a lot of great innovation is happening. We have over 50 different labs. And if you have code projects that are blockchain or digital identity related, you know, welcome to you know, take a look at it and, and, and come bring them here. Um, and we started thinking you know, the, the community as we're implementing these blockchain networks and different enterprise use cases and supply chain and healthcare and more is that it, it is not one network to rule them all. Right? It is a global network of networks. And enterprises and companies might need to participate in many of them. Right? There's, uh, you can you know, be part of a financial market network and a global trade network and regional networks. And those assets have to actually go across networks. So as you, real use cases came up, there's a need for, global, uh, for interoperability between uh, distributed ledgers. Um, so we are addressing, uh, you know, blockchain DLT fragmentation. Uh, we're trying to save app developers from reinventing the wheel, right? Having to do the same thing over and again, and then lowering the risk of adoption uh, by those distributed ledgers. So in 2020, we um, brought in a project, and it was launched from the labs called Cactus, um, and now it's called Cacti because one cactus. Um, and uh, is just one, one, one cactus, and cacti is multiple cactuses. Um, and we, uh, a lab called Weaver, which was an IBM contribution, was incorporated into cacti uh, earlier this year. So we renamed it cacti, which was the first time we've done that to a project. Um, but cacti is, think of it as an SDK of SDKs, a blockchain of blockchains. Um, and it is really a, a way for blockchains. So for example, you might be on a network that is using R3 Corda, um, and you are uh, um, having to bring assets over to a fabric um, network, um, you can use Cacti to do that uh, safely as well. Um, in 2021, we rebranded ourselves to the Hyperledger Foundation um, as an umbrella foundation because we were no longer just one project, one you know, distributed ledger technology. And as you can see, we really have a breadth of things. New things that are coming up and new use cases, things like hybrid blockchains. Um, and a hybrid blockchain is when there are parts of, 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 of the network that are on, on, a, on a public blockchain and parts on a permission and permissionless. Um, and it's really giving an opportunity for companies that need a permissioned network within a consortium to then also interact with the public, 
public uh, network. Maybe do attestations on the public network as well. Uh, and uh, that's a zonkey. For those of you who don't know, that's a mix between a donkey and a zebra. And in the United States, they call it a zonkey. So it's a hybrid animal as well. And obviously, this is very important because enterprises uh, appreciate the value of a gas-free chain. So they run things on their permission or side chains. Um, and they have more predictable transaction life cycles. Uh, there's no need to hold crypto. Um, and it's desirable to allow these digital assets to flow to and from uh, the public chains and the gas chains as well. So we're seeing a lot of innovation and a lot of work happening specifically around that as well. Uh, one uh, member company that's doing some work is Hedera. They have a public Hedera uh, blockchain network um, and they are supporting Hyperledger Fabric so that companies can uh, verify uh, that on the public chain as well. Um, in uh, 2021, we brought in more um, with Hyperledger, Firefly, and Bevel. Um, Hyperledger Firefly is a Web3, you know, is, helps uh, organizations build and scale Web3 applications. Um, so they have hundreds of different APIs um, that allow you to build digital assets, data flows, blockchain transactions, et cetera. Um, they support uh, these Hyperledger, Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Besu, as well as some of the other popular uh, uh, permission blockchains, Quorum, R3, um, and then obviously a lot of the public blockchains as well. Um, so Firefly is really a great way for, for companies to, um, to start their building. Uh, and there are many use cases. Uh, if you attended uh, one of the sessions yesterday around interoperability, we spent some time talking about the use cases that Hyperledger Firefly is already powering in the marketplace as well um, around healthcare, you know, Web3 startups, CBDC projects, et cetera. Um, and in 2022, which is the year that we're in now, uh, we have Hyperledger Solang, uh, which is a Solidity uh, compiler, and Hyperledger Anon Creds, another identity project, came out of Indy, got pulled out, um, and now can be used. Um, it's ledger agnostic, and it can actually be also used. It doesn't have to have a blockchain behind it. Um, and Anon Creds is uh, short for anonymous credentials, so it's supporting a very common verifiable VC format um, in the identity space as well. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot about non-creds and verifiable credentials going on. So a couple of things, you know, as you think about the news, um, you know, the FTX news, for example, that's been in the news and some of the other major crypto specific uh, sessions reminds me very much of 2017 when I first joined Hyperledger in 2017 was during the ICO uh, bust. And that's when everybody was raising millions and millions and millions of dollars and they just, you know, went really bad. And we just kept our heads down and we continued building these solutions that were solving real business problems, right? It wasn't speculation. It wasn't about coins. It wasn't about, you know, uh, building these large companies, but really uh, about building the technology, once again, that's open, that is contributed worldwide, meaning, you know, we have a global contribution base. Um, and tokenization is, an, you know, one of the things that continues to be very important. Uh, BCG just created this report where they estimate uh, asset tokenizations to reach about $16 trillion by 2020. Um, and BNY's uh, CEO just took some time to write a, a very comprehensive um, uh, opinion piece that was published in the Financial Times, um, specific around tokenization. Uh, requirements and regulatory and that there does need to be some regulatory guidance um, from uh, the world. So if you think about, if you're not, you know, if you think what is tokenization, a token is a digital, digital representation of the asset itself. Um, an asset is something that has value. So money, stocks, derivatives, real estate, certificates, uh, warehouse receipts, you know, loyalty programs, precious, those are all assets. And as you can imagine, move, having to move those assets around. Um, and tokenization is a process of I issuing and managing those tokens. So as you can imagine, financial services and banks are very interested in seeing how they can leverage and how they can continue to tokenize assets um, to create commodity and to create uh, liquidity for them as well. Um, and tokenization obviously helps, and there's lots of different approaches that the Hyperledger projects can support um, in doing those asset uh, changes as well. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Finality is one of the production use cases. Uh, now has 17 different major institutions, including some here in Japan, um, who are participating um, in this uh, collateral assets, um, which are tokenized and pulled am among the, the blockchain network. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more of these tokenized platforms coming out. I know there's a couple of banks that are working on some 
pretty big um, uh, projects using Hyperledger Besu as well. So you'll be seeing that in the next few weeks. Um, a couple other things that are important you know, around uh, digital uh, platforms for green bond tokenization. Um, so there's been some work with the Hon uh, Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the BIS, um, and they're using Hyperledger Fabric and Beisu uh, to create some prototypes um, to do uh, green bond uh, issuance um, and, and tracking as well. Um, and there's a, a great video with uh, Bernadette Nolans, who's the head of the BIS, that uh, goes into the detail. Uh, another DL uh, tokenization, DL Piper, the, one of the largest uh, uh, legal firms in the world, um, is using Hyperledger Fabric along with Hedera, that public chain that I mentioned before, um, to do, uh, to, they basically create a, a digital assets engine um, using uh, that. So I think you'll start seeing more and more of these um, and maybe not, you know, such splashy headlines around you know, the fall of FTX. There's real work, real value, um, and real solutions that are bringing value as well. So three areas of digital identity that, um, you know, that we have seen in, in the marketplace and in the industry for a while is, you know, centralized. Um, so we have centralized, federated. Uh, federated is like sign on with your Twitter ID. And nowadays, you know, a lot of work is happening with decentralized, uh, the decentralized identifiers, the DIDs were approved by the W3C as a standard. Um, a lot of the work that's happening with verifiable credentials, um, obviously with uh, the DIF and the trust over IP that I mentioned before. Um, and digital wallets are everywhere, right? I mean, if you think about it, um, I started the presentation talking about the fact that we want to have, you know, our assets and our identity to be able to go from place to place to place. And digital wallets are one of those things across all the different use cases that I might have talked about and you can imagine uh, that um, are, are being um, worked on and put together. But today, you know, maybe a digital wallet, you know, uh, you know five, ten years ago uh, was just from a payment perspective or maybe a loyalty card. But today, you need to have multi-purpose wallets. And you really, nobody wants to have 15 wallets to do 15 different things and then have to understand, well, I can, you know, I can give this credential to this wallet but not this wallet. So how do we make this much easier for the user um, to, from the consumer perspective, um, and really make it a multi-purpose and inter interactive. And this is one of the things that the Open Wallet Foundation is working on and partnering with other organizations like Hyperledger, for example, and Trust Over IP and DIFF. Um, and this is the Trust Over IP stack, as I mentioned earlier on. It's a, a really great work that th this community has put out. But layer two, peer-to-peer -peer communications, is really addressing that agent wallet um, and there's different approaches and different ways to do it. Um, and the Open Wallet Foundation is certainly a place to do that. So today, when you say digital wallet, everybody pretty much thinks of, you know, their Google wallet or the Apple wallet. And maybe you have, you know, custom wallets uh, for other projects. But pr primarily, the digital wallet is either uh, a Google Android wallet or um, Apple. And Samsung obviously also uses the Android wallet as well. Uh, but today, many, many people, including the European Union, they've been very vocal about this with a lot of the work that they've put out in research and tenders even, is that um, they don't believe that it should only have two options. You shouldn't only um, have Google or Apple to decide from. And we believe here at the Linux Foundation um, that a global open uh, source community can certainly solve that. Um, and this is something that we've been working on for the last few months. Um, and so these are some of the initial building blocks that um, the Open Wallet Foundation is looking at, payment tokenization, ISL, uh, MDL, verifiable credentials, the anonymous credentials, and non-cred specification, which once again sits under Hyperledger. Um, and there's a couple ones, and I know there's a couple of discussions also with the car manufacturers, with some of the, I think it's the CCC consortium, um, uh, some of those uh, standards as well. So coming soon, we're going to have the Open Wallet Foundation, um, and it is supporting various open source projects to basically create interoperable digital wallets, um, infrastructure, and support as well. Um, so uh, this is an open call to join any of our communities that I mentioned today, uh, but the open source, uh, the uh, OWF, uh, as I said, is just starting. We have currently about 300 entities around the world that are collaborating with that as well. So uh, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Maybe we have a question. Uh, do we have time for one question? Maybe, uh, and if anybody has questions? We're at time. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you for your time, and we'll see you soon.